Welcome to our Cities of Tufts virtual colloquium. I'm Professor Julian Adjuman, and together with my research assistants, Deandra Boyle and Muram Bakari, and our partners, Shareable and the Bar Foundation, we organize Cities at Tufts as a cross-disciplinary academic initiative, which recognizes Tufts University as a leader in urban studies, urban planning, and sustainability issues. I'd like to acknowledge, and we would all like to acknowledge, that Tufts University's Medford campus is located on colonized Wampanoag and Massachusetts traditional territory. We are delighted today to host my friend and longtime colleague, Dr. Kristin Reynolds, Chair and Assistant Professor of Food Studies at the New School in New York. As a geographer with expertise in international agricultural development, she's interested in understanding how uneven power dynamics in the food system originate and articulate at different community and geopolitical scales. Using critical and participatory action research, her work focuses on informing the creation of more socially just food systems through scholarship, policy and activism. Dr. Reynolds' first book, and I've got to say people here, this is my favorite book title ever, period. Beyond the Kale, Urban Agriculture and Social Justice Activism in New York City, which she co-authored with Nevin Cook, examined the work of community-based activists to advance social justice through urban agriculture and roles that research and scholarship can play in such initiatives. Her forthcoming book, Radical Food Geographies, Power, Knowledge and Resistance, co-edited with Colleen Hamelman and Charles Levko, will be published uh, next year. Kristin, a Zoomtastic welcome to Cities at Tuts. Over to you. Thank you very much, Julian, for that lovely and glowing introduction. Um, I'm so happy to be here and thank you for inviting me to speak with you all today. Um, I'm just going to take a second to share my screen with the slides. So I also want to begin um, by acknowledging that the new school uh, located in Manhattan is located on traditional and unceded Lenape territories uh, and acknowledging it's part of the social justice practice that I attempt to in, uh, employ in all of the work that I do as a scholar. Um, so I'm very happy to be here with you all talking today about um, some of my work on urban agriculture um, and using action research as appro approaches to advance racial and economic equity. Uh, so I'll be I'll give some background to how we think about urban agriculture in this field, um, a little bit about what I mean when I'm talking about action research, uh, and then provide a few three examples uh, from some of my past, and thank you for the shout out on Beyond the Kale uh, and current work uh, in this area. So first of all, I want to say that there's not one singular history of urban agriculture in the United States. There are, in fact, multiple histories um, that intersect with each other. Um, I want to give some highlights that will be um, good background for the rest of the talk. Um, to begin, uh, what do we mean when we talk about urban agriculture? In the field, that is in the scholarly field, but I think also in the literal field, um, we think about urban agriculture as the growing of food and non-food crops, like flowers, for example, and the raising of livestock uh, in and around cities, but also its integration into the social, economic, and ecological fabric of the urban landscape. Uh, Urban agriculture may not produce the highest and best use when we're talking about the urban planning sense of the term in terms of the use of urban space, um, but it produces multiple and intersecting benefits. Um, some we talk about these in categories such as health benefits, increased access to healthy food, um, opportunities to spend time outside, social benefits in terms of interacting with neighbors that one might not otherwise interact with, um, youth development, economic benefits like food affordability uh, and in the case of organizations that create jobs, creating some jobs in the community. Um, and then ecological, increasing biodiversity, um, helping to reduce urban heat island effect. So we talk about these intersecting benefits as part of the um, overall uh, picture of urban agriculture and what it brings to the city. Um, on this infographic, which comes out of another um, project that I was part of, uh, we see some ideas of what the forms of urban agriculture are. Um, so I think community gardens are usually the most familiar to people, um, folks growing for themselves or their families or, or their extended community um, on a small plot. Uh, community farms where people are working together, often these are youth projects, growing food um, for sale or, or even to give away in low-income communities. 
um, institutional farms like uh, and gardens like those at hospitals or school gardens um, where these are used for therapeutic and or educational purposes as well as growing the food. Uh, and then commercial farms, which I'll talk more about a bit later, um, but as the name suggests, farms in, uh, in cities that are selling their products. So that's a kind of an overview of what we talk about when we mean uh, urban agriculture. So as I noted, there are diverse histories that get told about urban agriculture in the United States. Um, so I'll start with this narrative, which is that um, there are there's you know centuries of examples of, of people growing food in cities. Um, the late 19th century um, is the pinpoint that is often placed on government support for urban agriculture um, with the pingree potato patches that were, it was land that was provided to urban residents by the mayor of Detroit uh, seeking to um, address food insecurity in the wake of the economic uh, downturn, as well as to quell potential unrest. In the early 20th century in New York, um, progressives of that era who were fearing um, the loss of um, what they saw as uh, value, good values in the wake of indus increasing industrialization um, and loss of contact with nature created uh, garden, children's gardens that brought children, and you might note from this uh, picture, uh, rather well-to-do children outside to engage in gardening work, to learn about agriculture and food um, and to, to be outside. Uh, in the both world wars in the United States, as well as other countries, including the UK, uh, the federal government uh, created a program, well, programs, um, including Victory Garden programs, in which the government provided education and um, uh, tried to promote the use of gardening in cities. Uh, in order to divert bur rural agricultural products um, from urban consumers to the, the allied war effort. Um, a statistic is that at one point in the 40s, 44% of uh, vegetables consumed in the United States were grown uh, in cities. If you're interested in, um, in government videos, I encourage you to look up Victory Garden videos and you'll see lots of um, very convincing uh, educational uh, footage from the time. Um, and then, it, so these were, you know, largely government driven urban agriculture initiatives. Uh, and in the 60s and 70s uh, began, began uh, a new era of urban agriculture and urban farming uh, that was more grassroots driven. Here I put a picture of the Boston Urban Gardeners, um, a group that was created in the, uh, in the 1970s um, to build gardens um, in the city of Boston. Also, this also took place in New York. So for those who are not familiar with New York, these are the five boroughs, Manhattan, the Bronx, let's go this way, Queens, Brooklyn, and Island. And so like in other cities like Boston, during this time period, um, uh, there was economic Christ, fiscal crisis uh, globally, as well as in the city's budget, uh, and unscrupulous landlords who would burn down apartment buildings so that they could collect insurance money. So this, combined with racist policies of the time, created a situation with the, where, where, in which there were lots that were seen by some as, as vacant, though that term, and we can discuss later uh, the contestation of, of that framing of, of, of land, but uh, that there were lots that might have started out looking like this, that gardeners, farmers, uh, individuals living in the communities or not living in the communities, uh, kind of took these spaces over and started to make uh, community gardens um, on them. Uh, at that time, this was, so this was the beginning of of the grassroots movement for urban gardening in New York, uh, the government, city government followed suit creating the Green Thumb program, which is part of our New York City Parks and Rec Department, and to this day manages the majority, well, a large number of the community gardens in New York City. Um, at this time, there were also federal HUD block grants that uh, provided funding for uh, gardens in low-income communities, which brings us to the reality that many of the gardens um, in New York City are located in low-income neighborhoods. Um, skipping through a few decades, um, gardens, we talked. I talked a little bit about the social benefits, but gardens are also used and continue to be used not only as places to grow food, um, but also as spaces where uh, communities can continue to uh, live their cultural practices, such as this example of a casita in a community garden in the Bronx, casitas being uh, among other cultures, also using um, 
these small structures in a garden as a place for social gathering. Um, and this is a Puerto Rican run garden. Uh, so those are a few examples of uh, urban agriculture and its history in the United States. Um, but I'd like to always feel it's important to introduce some critiques um, to urban agriculture, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the second narrative. So first of all, um, it is true, this, is, this part is not a critique, it is true that farms urban farms and gardens often sell their products uh, in the city. Um, and often that is in an effort to provide the food access to those who can't afford um, healthy and fresh vegetables. Now the critique, and this I think this critique is more relevant probably in the scholarly world than it is in the on the ground grassroots community world, but it's important to highlight nonetheless, is a question of whether using commercial garden, um, sell, sales of garden products in the city to address food security is just representing neoliberalization. And that is the role, the supporting the rollback of government social service and social safety networks um, that or addressing deeper issues uh, that surround food security by simply selling food. So here's one critique that exists. A second critique is that um, because of the fact that gardens can um, increase property values, um, urban gardens, when they come into, when they are created in neighborhoods um, that are low income, can end up pushing out uh, long-time residents. So this is, a, this is a critique that's taken very seriously. This one is certainly not just an academic debate. Um, and then, and then finally, I want to talk about the politics of representation um, as they relate to race, class, and power in this system. So what you see on the screen is the image of an article that was. Um, published in New York Mag Magazine in 2010, um, called What an Urban Farmer Looks Like. And in this article, there were beautiful photographs of urban farmers, um, most of whom were white folks, uh, which doesn't represent the reality of urban farming in New York City. Now, and this was problematic in terms of how it's presented. What is this like up and coming, you know, trend in, in New York? I want to, I always want to be uh, fair when I talk about this, that many of the gardeners that were, were featured in this uh, piece, including the person that you see on the slide, um, were very vocal about the fact that they didn't think that this represented New York City urban agriculture, that this needed to present a more diverse picture. Um, and so that was important. And coming back to the point about representation, when we see these kinds of narratives that say, here's what an urban farmer is, um, and here, you know, large on the screen, uh, this can reinforce um, political um, and financial inequalities insofar as media representation can bring political policy attention. It can bring funding from large um, or well deep pocketed people and organizations. So these are some critiques that are important to keep in mind when we talk about urban agriculture and its potential benefits. Um, and these patterns are particularly bothersome, in, and I'm speaking mostly today to the context of New York, because it's the context that I know the best, um, particularly bothersome when we recognize what the reality is in terms of folks who have been leading urban agriculture um, in New York for its at least many decades history. It's diverse. The city is diverse, and the leadership in urban agriculture is diverse. So these are three individuals and one group that I'll talk a bit more about later who are very much leaders in the food food justice, environmental justice, and urban agriculture um, community here in the city. Yannette Fleming, who also goes by Farmer Jan, La Finca del Sur, which is a group um, in the South Bronx led by women of color and their alleys. That's how they describe themselves. Ray Figueroa at the Friends of Brook Park um, in the South Bronx, and Elder Abu Talib, who um, is one of the leaders of the Takwa community farm in the Bronx. Um, so before moving on, I want to close out this piece about the kind of general concepts in urban agriculture by talking about general challenges. So some of these include policy restrictions in cities that, for example, disallow people to grow food in their front lawns um, or grow, raise particular livestock. Um, these are challenges confronted by urban farmers in many cities throughout the world, not just in the United States. Um, challenges having access to land or having land tenure. In, the, in New York, there's been a long-term debate about um, how long gardeners are able to use or have um, access to, to the sites uh, that is land that is owned by the city. Um, infrastructural challenges like accessing water um, uh, are also something that is experienced in lots of places 
accessing things that you might find very easily in rural areas like straw or fencing, right? So these are general challenges. Uh, funding for small items, large and small, from seeds and tools to fencing and generators. And then finally, the challenge of perceived legitimacy or Ill illegitimacy, I suppose, um, in terms of thinking about urban agriculture and whether it is a legitimate or good use of urban space when we think about this context of highest and best use, the potential to use that space for other things like um, income generating rents or housing. Um, and then in terms of legitimacy as real, quote unquote, real agriculture. Um, and so this is also a challenge throughout the world. One of the couple of these images on the right hand my right hand side anyway of the slide, um, uh, demonstrate some of the government actions in New York City that have um, basically kind of enacted or acted on this perceived lack of legitimacy for urban agriculture in the city. Um, Giuliani, when he was mayor in the 90s, sought to sell off um, many of the city-owned gardens. Those were eventually saved by a couple of nonprofit organizations. Um, and this came back in about 2015 and 16 uh, when de, Blasio was, de Blasio's administration had also proposed to sell off um, gardens in order to build housing. So these are examples of general challenges to urban agriculture that we um, discuss. They can be felt more by some communities and particularly as, as uh, related to what I'll be talking about in a little bit, um, low-income communities, those that are experiencing the brunt of structural racism vis-a-vis -vis policymaking. Um, so I want to then close this section by saying that uh, despite these you know, debates and challenges and drawbacks and critiques, um, I always like to point out that I think urban agriculture is a positive, a net positive for our cities. Um, and then you know, delving down deeply into how exactly it can help to um, advance uh, justice and sustainability is an important part of, of our work um, as scholars. So coming to action research, um, this term gets thrown around a lot and it can mean lots of different things. So to frame what I want to talk about here, um, I consider, or the way that I use action research um, is as uh, seeing research uh, as a tool to advance social change. This can be participatory action research. That means action research that involves community members in the design conducting research, analysis, writing up um, results, et cetera. Um, but it doesn't have to be participatory. And I think that's an important part of this, um, this work that uh, oftentimes these words get used interchangeably. But as we've found in some of our research, sometimes the participatory part isn't wanted or, or needed by communities, but the research can be contributing to their work nonetheless. Um, so action research has diverse roots um, in various thinkers throughout the world, three that I will highlight, W.E.V. Du Bois, who in the late 19th and early 20th centuries worked with African-American folks in communities near Atlanta to conduct surveys documenting racialized inequality um, and disparities in their community. And his work more broadly uh, was uh, among the leaders in establishing the fact that racism is a structural rather than an individual um, reality in our society, or problem in our society, I should say. Uh, Kurt Lewin in the 1940s worked with workers in industrial uh, factories in the United States to conduct research to improve their practices. Um, and he, in fact, was the first, as far as I understand it, to use the exact term action research. Paulo Freire was, a, was an educator in Brazil who taught folks in Brazil who were not literate how to read so that they could address some of the political challenges they were facing on their own without being uh, reliant on outside uh, researchers or elites to, um, to engage in that work. And so these are some of the key figures that you hear about when we, when we talk about urban, I'm sorry, not urban agriculture, action research. Um, and so then there's, of course, critique, um, and I want to talk about the critical approach. So a, a critique sometimes of action research is whether is this bias, because there's an objective to use the research for social change, does that mean that it can't be considered like solid research? 
Um, and a couple of responses to this are first that there's a debate about this question of objectivity in all of social science that goes back hundreds of years. The fact that this that it's action research doesn't mean that it's more biased or less biased. That has to do with the integrity of the research and also again connects, or we can you know be reminded of the fact that in social science there's this debate about whether because we're, we as social scientists are looking at social problems, we can never actually be objective, right? So that's a large debate. I won't go further with that unless anyone wants to talk about it in the Q&A. But um, I think that it's important then to, for those using action research, as all research, to use sound and rigorous methods. We don't bias our results. We, in, we use um, standardized data collection processes, um, et cetera, so that we can get real, you know, the best data that we can to inform the, the changes, whether it's about food, food justice, environment, you know, other social problems, um, the best data that we can. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say on this is that there are also critical approaches. Um, Maria Elena Torre, uh, Michelle Fine, and their colleagues at the Public Science Project in, at the CUNY, City University of New York, um, talk about this approach of critical participatory action research, um, which encompasses all of what I've just talked about, but also is specifically using feminist standpoint theory, thinking about positionality of researchers, um, uh, recognizing the positionality of researchers, following the lead of community um, when conducting participatory research. Um, and so, and recognizing the diversity of thinkers that have been tributaries to the, the broader field of action research. Uh, so this is the approach that I tend to follow uh, in my work in seeking to use uh, action research or research to inform, you know, positive change towards racial and economic justice in the food system. So now I'll give three short examples from my work uh, using these approaches. Uh, the first is the illustrious Beyond the Kale, Urban Agriculture and Social Justice Activism in New York City. Um, with Nevin Cohen, my colleague, we published this book in 2016. Uh, we had four overarching goals for this study and the book itself. Um, first, we wanted to understand um, what strategies urban agriculture activists and leaders in New York were using to specifically address social justice, that is racial justice, economic justice, gender justice, those kinds of questions through urban agriculture um, beyond the general um, benefits like improving food access or providing outdoor space um, for people to gather. Um, we specifically wanted to speak with um, of folks of color and women who were leading this work. Uh, and I guess I skipped around, so I'll just finish that point. The reason that we wanted to do that is we wanted to help to shift the narrative through our work away from this thing that we were seeing, like I talked about a few minutes ago, uh, this, this tendency to say, oh, look in the media, look at this new uh, urban agriculture activity that's cropping up and all you see is like white hipsters, right? And we knew that wasn't true. And so we wanted to use the skills that we had and the access that we had to publishing to help shift that narrative. Um, Coming back to this point here, we wanted to understand how specifically uh, folks and groups using urban agriculture were addressing political and economic inequity uh, in the city. And then coming down to the last point, we wanted to ask, learn, understand if there were possibilities for social scientists like ourselves to use our tools of research um, and our access to publishing, et cetera, to support this kind of on the ground work. The project built on a project that we were part of prior to Beyond the Kale called Five Borough Farm, in which we, with a group of additional um, researchers, sought to understand and, and document the whole landscape of urban agriculture in New York, um, propose policy recommendations and metrics and evaluation tools to understand what was happening broadly. In that study, we heard from people that there were racial, economic, and gender-based disparities throughout the urban agriculture community in New York City. And because we weren't focused on this uh, and didn't, we weren't able to write too much about this in, in this uh, publication, Five Borough Farm, we thought, you know, we're just going to do another study on this so that we can really uh, investigate or dig into to this problematic. So we conducted interviews with uh, farmers and gardeners and nonprofit staff, um, again, uh, explicitly trying to speak with uh, women identified folks of color who were leaders in the field. Uh, we held a focus group, we held a public forum at the new school, 
uh, where we invited some of the folks that we were, we were speaking with in the interviews, as well as those working in academic institutions, to have a conversation about whether or how we might collaborate together to work on food and social justice issues or what scholars could do. Um, we engaged in participant observation of policymaking and activism, reviewed documents with policy, policy documents. Um, and our approach was a grounded theory approach. And that means that we weren't trying to test a theory and see if it was true on the ground, but rather listen to people as we asked them and they responded to the questions that we asked um, and, and try to kind of understand some, some broader trends and themes uh, that we were hearing from people on the ground. Uh, this map shows the sites of all of the um, people that we interviewed. So we made an effort to have representation in all of the boroughs, and we were happy that we succeeded uh, in doing that. So we heard a few things. Um, so this is, I know you've seen this slide before. That's intentional. I wanted to talk more about what these groups do. So Yannette Fleming, she also is known as Farmer Yan, uh, leads workshops for women farmers um, and women in the community uh, uh, that are focused on food justice, food justice, but also confronting patriarchy in their lives and confronting racism in the food system. Um, she's a very adamant and vocal leader in this field um, and also now does a lot of work with youth of color uh, leadership programs in her community. La Finca del Sur, as I mentioned, is a farm that describes itself as being run by women of color and their allies. Uh, they hold events and hold a safe space on this farm, um, which is, if I remember correctly, a couple acres in size uh, in the South Bronx, uh, in order to create safe spaces for women, but also to connect with the reality of women farmers in the global South, which are some of the communities of origin for some of the participants in this in this farm, uh, noting often that in some places of the world, women identified farmers make up 50% or more of the, the farmers, though the representation is often that agriculture is a male activity. Ray Figueroa uh, is at Friends of Brook Park and has since become the president of the New York City Community Garden Coalition, and he um, runs programs that are both are, um, bringing folks to the farm to engage in policy advocacy that brings together advocacy for gardens and for housing. As you might imagine, oftentimes, I'm sure it's true in many, I know it's true in many cities, garden advocacy is pitched against affordable housing. Like why should we build a garden when we can build affordable housing? Ray has uh, worked with colleagues to have, to bring, to bring those two com advocacy communities together and argue for both of those things, both and kind of approach. He also runs an alternative to incarceration program for youth um, and we can recognize that um, the majority of youth in New York City who are involved in the quote criminal justice system are Latinx and are Black African American youth. And so there's this you know, multiple layers of justice that are embedded in the work that Ray Figueroa is leading. Uh, and then finally, again, uh, Elder Abu Talib, who is the one of the leaders at the Takwa Community Farm in the South Bronx, who uses this farm to pass on agricultural traditions to younger generations to make safe spaces again for youth in a place where there's not a lot of out other kind of greenery and outdoor space where youth can just gather and, and be free. Uh, so these are ways that these particular individuals and the organizations that they work with are using urban farm sites to specifically work on racial and economic and gender justice issues that step beyond, again, just um, the important part, the other important part of this, which is, which is growing food. Um, uh, and then I would like to ask you to think back to what I mentioned in terms of general challenges to urban agriculture, um, land access, funding. Well, in the interviews with, with, with these folks, we heard about those challenges and others, right, that are connected to the reality of uneven power and privilege as it plays out in, in the New York City environment. Uh, so the reality of political disenfranchisement in low-income communities, uh, not having the easy access to city council members, for example, to try to advocate for a change in a local law to support a particular agricultural activity. Um, having limited financial resources in the community. Stories like needing a few hundred dollars to buy a generator and, and the individuals in the community don't just have that in their pockets, wherein it's in a well, more wealthy community, that might be the case. Uh, stereotypes like, um, and I'm repeat, you know, reporting on what we heard in our research, stereotypes like um, farmer, 
farmers that might come and sell at a farmer's market in a low-income community thinking, no, folks in that community don't like fruits and vegetables, or thinking it's too too violent and, and dangerous, so I won't sell my products there. I won't go there. Um, you know, to be clear, this is these kinds of stereotypes are really what some of the groups are even responding to, right? They can't get farmers from the rural settings, or they couldn't, to come and sell at their markets, so they've then grown their own. Uh, the challenge of not being trendy. I'll talk in a few minutes about like commercial urban agriculture, um, rooftop farming, these things that you see that are like, you know, the new pe the new face, the, the non-human face of up and coming uh, urban agriculture. Uh, and so what we heard from folks is that funders were like really excited about uh, rooftop farms or they're really excited about, you know, these controlled environment agriculture um, spaces and people just doing kind of you know, boring old farming in the ground weren't trendy enough or weren't exciting enough for funders to be giving them money. Of course, this was not across the board, but it was a challenge confronted and expressed by some of the folks that we spoke with. Uh, and then, uh, so a lot of these, you see this quote, I'm sure by now you've read this quote on the slide by a food justice uh, leader, Karen Washington, who kind of kind of sums up some of this power and privilege um, une unevenness as she has seen it play out in her community uh, with respect to urban agriculture and the food system more broadly. Um, but I wanted to close this slide by just mentioning that there also was mentioned that there was less support uh, funding for, um, you know, quote unquote, radical work and specifically um, Farmers and gardeners spoke about wanting to do, and they were doing anti-racist work, anti-racism work on their farms and gardens with youth, with, with adults. Um, but that funders didn't want to hear about that. They had to learn how to use like more placating language. They couldn't talk about this. Now, I think that this is some, some of this has shifted following the murder of George Floyd in 2020. Remember that this research was conducted almost 10 years ago now. Um, but I, I would suspect that some of this remains true. Uh, and so these are um, challenges that have been experienced more specifically than the broader challenges of land access and, and the broad challenge of needing funding, et cetera. Um, and so as a final point from this book, before I move on to another couple of quick examples, um, we ask, we ask specifically ask questions, as I mentioned, about what roles researchers might play. Oftentimes this comes out in the end of a book or the end of a publication and those writing just kind of think about it and write what they think would be good, which is great. And we can also ask folks on the ground. So, you know, we asked that question if you, in a few different ways. Here are some of the things that we heard um, that we researchers out from the outside can highlight and legitimize urban agriculture and social justice activism. Um, you know, that's what we tried to do in this book and that's not why I'm recording on it, but um, that rather than focusing on um, documenting constantly like the types of urban agriculture that exist out there, um, what about like raising, lifting up this critical and important work that's being done that is often uh, not highlighted in media? Again, yes, a little bit more now, I think, but the point still stands. Um, contextualizing urban food concerns in terms of, it's not just about whether there's a supermarket there, but it's about, you know, inequitable food access is about it's about racialized poverty. It's about multi-generational unemployment, right? And that this is a role that scholars can play when we can write pieces and, and conduct analyses that really contextualize what's going on in the broader social and economic structure. Uh, and then finally, this part is about approaches. Um, that uh, we heard folks tell us, we don't really need to, you to ask more questions about what we're doing. And I don't mean interview questions, but broad research questions, but rather like take, diff take a different approach engage with us in community-driven research, to do, um, work with us on participatory action research in some cases, not everybody said this, right? Yeah. Um, and I think this is really revelatory. And when we, you know, in, in the research world, you're know, always thinking about like, what's the newest research question? Um, and, and that continues to be true, but, but then also stepping back to think about how we enact the social justice practices that we write about theoretically in the work that we do as researchers and scholars. So, that's a quick overview of that book. I'll talk about briefly about two more current projects. Um, the first is about some evolutions in commercial urban agriculture and policy. So I'm speaking from a couple of research briefs that I've written in the past few years that pertain more specifically to New York City um, and Paris. I did some work with a colleague, Ségolène Dali. Um, and then I will talk, I, I'm also talking about some ongoing work with a a PhD student here at the new school. 
Uh, so commercial urban agriculture, I call it like 1.0, um, people growing food in the city and selling it. So Andrew Cote is a well-known beekeeper in New York City who sells at the green markets all over the place. You can look him up. He's a social media star. Um, Brooklyn Grange is the, was the first large outdoor rooftop farm um, commercial, and they have a nonprofit arm. Um, and Gotham Greens is a rooftop uh, greenhouse. They have rooftop greenhouses in New York and other cities like Chicago. Um, and this is a picture of their greenhouse in uh, Brooklyn on the top of a Whole Foods market. So this is what I call commercial urban agriculture 1.0. Um, and then there's ag tech. Now this doesn't just pertain, ag tech as a term is not only about urban agriculture, but of course that's what I'm focused on here today. Um, there's, I don't have time to get into a complete disambiguation of terms here, but ag tech broadly is, you know, use, the use of technology in agriculture, of course. Um, we can debate about what you consider, what we consider technology. But when I'm speaking about urban ag tech, it's um, examples like you see here on the slide. Vertical farming, which may be small scale or large in warehouses like you see in this photo. Uh, controlled environment agriculture. Well, they're all controlled environment agriculture actually, meaning they're not outside, they're controlled in terms of humidity, temperature and whatnot. Um, so this is an, a, a photo of the company Square Roots that grows in um, shipping containers. Oftentimes a lot of these um, types of production practices are using grow lights. Um, so like the pink has been this, um, this kind of, uh, it's the color du jour, uh, and growing mushrooms like small hold does in, um, again, controlled environments. This one is controlled uh, remotely and can even be controlled like at, at a distance in other, in restaurants and homes. Um, at my last count, there were at least 25 such sites in New York City proper. Um, that may be slight, like, slightly uh, higher by now, um, but this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about like ag tech and commercial urban agriculture. Um, we've also seen recently policy changes at multiple levels of government. Look, making it easier for uh, urban agriculture to, or communities to be zoned for urban agriculture, comprehensive plans that are addressing urban ag. There's one in the works in New York City. Um, policy papers and proposed legislation, such as this one, which was put out in 2020 by now mayor Eric Adams, but he was then borough president and mayoral candidate, um, claiming that urban agriculture could be part of kickstarting again New York's economy. You can see the, the, the reference to the pink lights here, I think. Um, at the state level, California was a leader in 2013, creating what it called um, agriculture incentive zones that uh, made uh, gave incentives for private landowners to uh, make their their land in cities available for commercial agriculture, urban agriculture use. Um, and I forgot to mention that I, though I don't know a lot about it, I, maybe we talk about it later, but I know that there has also been a, a recent re legislation in Boston, back to the municipal level, to also support um, commercial urban farming. Um, at the federal level, uh, aid, United States Department of Agriculture agencies began to pay attention to urban agriculture as the commercial and rooftop farming scene was kind of ramping up. Um, so they included them in their, you know, annual outlook for uh, started creating programs. Um, this is the Agricultural Marketing Service and the Farm Service Agency, which grants loans to farmers. Uh, and then the U.S. Farm Bill of 2018 created what is called the Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production. Um, through that uh, provision in the Farm Bill, <coughs> excuse me, this office and a director position was created, a granting program was created to support this type of activity, um, the, as well as a federal and local county offices and committees to advise um, Secretary of Agriculture on, urban, on supporting urban agriculture and innovative production. So these are all positive steps for urban agriculture writ large, um, but there are some narrative shifts that are also taking place that we need to pay attention to, including a tendency, and here I'm also referring to some work by colleagues, uh, Goodman and Minner in 2019, as well as Fairbairn, Edmund Fairbairn, and Julie Guthman and, and colleagues who have, a, have had a large project looking at this tech sector. Um, so solutionism, a narrative that urban agriculture Ag tech in particular is going to help solve food insecurity under climate change, contribute to urban sustainability. Um, this is being pitched in both business and government sectors, as you can see represented by these images on the slide. 
<clears throat> but we have to question this um, first in terms of the types of products that urban agriculture tends to produce. It's not staple crops like grains and tubers, but rather salad greens, right? Um, but also in terms of like the solutionism is create, you know, pitching urban agriculture as the silver bullet without necessarily compelling us to look beyond why we have food insecurity and, and why we're seeing increasing environmental degradation and climate change. Um, and then the second part of this is uh, the pitch of profitability. <clears throat> Look online, you'll see lots and lots of this kind of uh, narrative um, that urban tech, ag tech is going to be a great investment for venture capitalists. Um, there are mixed results in the latest result, uh, report from the ag tech firm Ag Funder that does a annual census of urban agriculture, uh, controlled environment agriculture. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the, this pitch is often the triple win, people, profit, planet, food security, environmental sustainability, and profitability. Um, but then when we see all of this happening, we have to take pause, I think, and think about the effects that the legitimization of commercial urban agriculture, and particularly high-tech urban ag, um, might have on the structure of the field, or, we can, or it might be called the sector in this case, um, what does it mean for community-based and grassroots organizations that are that are trying to grow food for their communities and do some of the things that I talked about um, in the Beyond the Kale book? And then second, what effects might this have on racial or economic equity in the food system? So this is something that I'm addressing with a paper, in a paper I'm writing with my one of my graduate students, Cedric uh, Gottfried, here at the New School. So I know I'm about out of time, but I just want to close by talking about a new initiative that I'm starting um, called the Food and, Food and Social Justice Action Research Lab at the New School. Um, I have a, another graduate student, Constance Smith, who is helping me with this. Our vision is to contribute to racial and economic justice through action research, to collaborate with community-based uh, organizations and institutions, including um, BIPOC and people of a global majority uh, led groups and to build relationships with community members and others consumed with food and social justice to collaborate together in ways that seem uh, fit. So I, this is being, I'm kind of building this out within our food studies program. Um, information is at this website that you see on the slide. So we, in 2022 and 23 last year, uh, had conversations with community leaders to ask ask them, what might, what might we be able to do through research to support your work? We wanted to understand what are some similar initiatives that exist in New York at the new school so that we can build upon and contribute to this community um, and not be duplicative. Uh, and then we were exploring new uh, collaborations. So that our first project, and I know that Dr. Kara Woods was on the call at one point. I don't know if she's still here or not, but if you are, hello. Um, uh, our inaugural project is uh, looking at the social equity imp implications of this new Office of Urban Agriculture um, through a racial equity lens. And so this is a project that's in process. So I, don't, I won't report on any findings at this point, but we're seeking to understand is like what the implications when we think about the discriminatory practices of, on the part of the USDA toward um, farmers of color throughout a many decades history um, and how what we're seeing in terms of racial equity with the rollout of these um, farm bill mandate, these farm bill uh, created programs. Uh, the work is supported by the Socially Disadvantaged Farmers and Ranchers Policy Research Center at Alcorn State University. And so we're happy to be in collaboration with those folks and with Dr. Woods. Um, and so to conclude, I just want to kind of try to bring this all together, um, that we need to recognize, first of all, the significance of urban agriculture's multiple benefits. Um, I mean, this is something that's really often spoken about in urban agriculture work, um, but that be going beyond that, we also have to think about the structural dynamics of urban agriculture. When we think that, or we want to say that urban agriculture uh, produces social benefits or social justice benefits, um, we need to really examine those claims in the context of a given initiative or, or, or project. What do narrative capture mean for racial justice? What does it mean to just say urban agriculture, the garden's there, you know, an urban farm is there, now we'll have food security. And so I think that throughout, you know, all of this, I hope what I've communicated is that no matter the, the format of urban agriculture, we need to be asking these deeper questions about social and economic inequality. 
and inequity. And then finally, I think that there are real roles that action researchers can play in supporting this work on the ground. Um, I think we're in the turning point with urban agriculture and US policy. It's not to be overly optimistic, but there's certainly much more attention and actual policy action taking place. Um, and so it's a call, I suppose, to, and an invitation to those of you who are here who are engaged in research or want to be engaged in research or studying um, to, you know, think through how, how that work might be able to best contribute to this broader picture of advancing uh, racial and economic equity in the food system. So with that, I will thank you very much and happy to take your questions. Well, thank you so much, Kristin. What a what a great survey and expansive look across you know this this vibrant field which you know as we know is changing uh, all the time several questions um first one from ivy in chicago uh, ivy says in chicago south side community gardens are seen as a tool of gentrification what can we do to support these lands staying in neighbors hands and not being converted to development yeah that's a great Obviously a great question and always a conundrum um, in cities um, that where housing is expensive. I live in New York. We have a big affordable housing crisis here. Um, I think that maybe I'll say two things um, because I don't know um, what the what your involvement is, the, the person that asked the question in urban agriculture. If one is thinking that, oh, there's an empty lot, there should be a garden there talk with the community. Does the community want that? Or if you're part of the community still, talk with the rest of your community. Um, because I think a lot of times, uh, you know, the questions about gentrification are certainly first and foremost about affordability and housing, um, but it's also about community self-determination. And so in what ways are those of us who are interested in urban agriculture as an activity um, engaging with that problematic? And, you know, I have this question all the time and sometimes the answer is like, maybe a garden shouldn't go there, right? Um, but I think the other broad question is, or point is to get involved in policy advocacy. Um, I, you have the ward system, right, in, in, in Chicago. Speak with your local, your representatives, um, find out what's happening in terms of city zoning um, and make those connections. As I was speaking about one of the actor, the people in here in New York, make those connections between advocacy for housing justice and housing affordability and advocacy for community gardens and food access because they're often pitted against each other. But I think that what I've seen here in New York is that when, when alliance, strategic alliances can be built, um, that can help uh, address this broader equity from a broader lens than, than, than being about one versus the other. But I think, you know, gentrification is such a, such a conundrum because of the, of the, the affordability, affordability crisis. Um, so a couple of thoughts. Great. Thanks, Kristen. Um, Bobby Jones, a long question, but I'm going to cut, cut to a, a really important um, point. Speaking more broadly, what are some of the tangible ways commercial urban ag folks can show solidarity with the more traditional diverse urban ag that's not focused on commercial production? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think a lot of times my answer begins with talk with the communities, <laughs> um, <laughs> because I don't know the answer for all communities, of course. But um, beyond that quest, beyond that response, um, a lot of times, okay, so if there's narrative capture or, you know, capture of policy makers attention happening, uh, can the can those that are engaged in this high tech commercial urban ag say, well, yes, we are part of urban agriculture. And there's this other part of urban agriculture, and we want those folks to be in policy making decisions and conversations as well. So, you know, passing the mic, I guess, is what I'm saying, or including making the mic more inclusive. Um, and maybe, you know, if this comes back to asking the, the groups, but a lot of times community based groups are also in need of funds of some sort. So when we're seeing, you know, a million, hundred million dollars put into a venture, can some of that be used, um, you know, regranted or re given, I suppose, to organizations if they need it. But again, I come back to you, ask them. Yeah, good. Thank you. Joel Robinson, who's, I think, an architect because he she, they say, do you think it's possible for a role for architects, designers, et cetera, in socially responsible pro-sharing urban agriculture? Or does that always end up uh, being somebody's vanity project, taking the control away from the grassroots organizers? Elite capture, is that happening? 
Uh, yeah, I think so. I think I might have missed a key word in the question about sharing or, but. Um, yeah, I think the person, the question is about architects, designers. Is there a role for them in socially responsible and pro sharing urban agriculture? Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry to keep saying the same thing, but I think it has to do with asking the community. And, and you know, I work at the new school, right? And we have a large design school here. So I can from time to time interact with design students or design labs that are, you know, of course, everybody's interested in urban agriculture because it's exciting and it's fun, right? And I think that, you know, what I've seen is that sometimes the design field doesn't take that approach. I know there's the whole field of user-centered design. So I think that's part of it. But then um, again, what does the community want? And I mentioned a few minutes ago that I often get questions like this, um, you know, just even having conversations with people in my daily life about how to best help build gardens. And another answer I often give is to like be clear in like what you want to do in terms of the help? Do you want to help the community? Or do you want to build a garden? And sometimes those answers aren't, don't go together. Um, and if you want to build a garden, that's great. And find where that makes most sense in terms of the community desires. Um, if you really want to help the community, kind of the same answer from a different angle, what does the community need and want? And how can you use your skills as an architect to help support that? Thanks, Christine. Um, we have a Question from Patrizia Latreccia, um, University of South Florida. Thank you for a great talk. You were mentioning the narrative that uh, agriculture is a male activity. Uh, Patrizia is interested in women's presence in emerging farming, uh, or emerging in farming communities in Southern Italy, where historically women have been um, denied landowning because of uh, inheritance laws and rules. Um, and she says, today's communities of young farmers are appropriating rural traditions from remote areas, revealing an increasing feminization of agriculture. Is there a feminization of agriculture in the US as well? Um, well, I'm not, as, I'm not that familiar with the Italian agricultural context. I do know a bit about France, where I spend a lot of time, um, in terms of the United States. Um, so here's a, here's a question that also connects back to uh, statistics. Um, the USDA, if, for those who are unfamiliar, is the our main agency that collects agricultural statistics in the United States. And there's this five year, every five year census of agriculture um, where they collect those types of statistics. What has changed over time with the USDA census of agriculture is that they've changed the categories, and I won't get too much into the weeds here about this, but they've changed the categories such that more uh, female identified farmers are showing up in the agricultural census. And so we see that in terms of statistics, that's true. Um, in terms of, you know, has there been an actual shift on the ground? Um, what do I want to say about this? It's not really my area of research right now, but I did work on this many years ago and I worked in California, that I think that there's the recognition piece of it. And you started, I think this question started out in terms of the narrative. Um, but then there's also like the different like small scale and community spaces that are flourishing now that allow more uh, collaborative work with uh, among farmers who might not have found community. And so to specifically speak to this question of gender, <clears throat> Again, I'm stepping a little out of the area of what I work on, but I know a little bit about it. Um, the When I used to work on this, this topic, when I lived in California and worked in extension, I heard from people talking about how the, in the like, Purchasing supplies was male dominated. They wouldn't even, the salespeople wouldn't even speak with women farmers. Like all the equipment was like suited for large bodies, right? And I think that over time that that commute the the building out of a community of women, but also I want to bring into this quest into this topic, LGBTQ identified farmers has indeed, I think made more openings for farmers who are not men, not only to farm, but also to have a farming community that supports them in their work. Great, thanks. I think we've got probably time for one last question and that goes to Rahul. Are there any examples of non-commercial urban gardening ventures that have successfully gotten the attention of commercial funds, policymakers, philanthropists in any way, and what do they do? How do you manage the non-commercial and commercial pressures? Mm -hmm. um, let me think about that for a second. So uh, 
My first answer is I'm not totally sure, but what I want to say next is Absolutely. because, I mean, the reason I paused is because when I, funding for non-commercial gardens and farms is foundation grants, public monies, and individual donations. Funding for commercial, high-tech, urban ag, like I've been talking about, is at least coming from the private sector and a lot of times it's coming from venture capital. And so those funding streams don't necessarily meet. That's why I kind of paused. Um, but the example I wanna give is, is in fact about, I mentioned Karen Washington, she's a major food justice leader and community gardener here in New York City, um, who with three colleagues several years ago uh, was able to begin farming outside of the city um, in a place called Chester, New York. Um, it's called Rise and Root Farms Farm. Um, it's a, I was just there last weekend for one of their annual harvest events. And so it's a group of uh, women identified, two black farmers, three LGBTQ farmers who have started this community farm, building on the work that they have done in the city and certainly being able to have access to financial support through the networks that Karen Washington and her colleagues had built um, to start this farm, which is both addressing these like representational and equity to land access questions, but also um, uh, directing the food that they grow to lower income communities. So I know it's not exactly an answer to that question, but for me, it is an example of community gardens uh, and garden leaders focused on justice issues, being able to leverage some of the um, you know, social capital, I suppose, that they have to start farming outside of the city in a more con commercial, but certainly community-oriented sense. Well, Kristen, thanks so much for sharing your, your knowledge, your expertise, and, um, you know, your answers to questions are fantastic. Um, let's give a Cities at Tufts thank you to Kristen. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And our next colloquium is on October 25th, and it will feature Maya Singal, who's a PhD student talking about her doctoral research, How to Fight a Mega Jail. Fascinating. Thank you, and see you in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you. Bye-bye.